So hi everyone, Paul Sweeney and I got into the end of our conversation the other day and we were really just chatting already for an hour and so we decided just to cut it off then for the main interview uh, but we also decided then to just keep the cameras rolling and so this clip here is welcome to the second part of our conversation where we talk about much wider topics than just AI and how that's affected us in the collections uh, market but also talk about much broader topics uh, aside such as what artificial intelligence means, uh, the wider world, the earth, the environment and it all gets very similar philosophical uh, with the universe. So we thought we'd create that into a bit of a bonus clip for everyone. Uh, and so here it comes and please enjoy. I'm going to leave it recording. I know we're massively over time. No, but where I was going with the machine thing is, uh, and I, if you've got a few minutes now, sure, was, yeah. if you're an ant, if we're an ant, yeah. if you're an ant, are you aware of the wider colony that's actually going on? And you could say as a human, I could just think well, I'm an ant and yeah. I just interact with other ants. I'm a bit, bit philosophical yeah. here, but you could say, look, if I'm a person, am I aware of almost like this larger being that's almost like going on, which is like human society? And are we, and is technology just another aspect of that larger society that, that's going on? And so that's what I mean by are we almost like getting embedded within it? I'm being very philosophical no, no, here, it, and I don't want to put that in. No, but it's, I'm super comfortable. I just wonder. Uh, okay, just to take the analogy. Yeah. So there's a book I start reading and then I threw it against the wall. But it was oh, super intelligence was the name of the book. Yeah. And so the analogy was, OK, so that ant colony is a form of super intelligence, but an organization is also a form of super intelligence yeah. because an organization is sensing and responding to the environment around us and sending information and generating bodies of knowledge. And therefore, it has a form of intelligence, which we don't think about. So sometimes the company knows stuff that we don't. And it tells us stuff and then we act on it. So we are in like larger bodies. To go back to the ant example, there's another. So I'll, uh, the ant example seems to be driven by pheromones. So the system that we're not understanding is how a pheromone system works in the insect mm. world and what its communicative and coordinative values are and what patterns they seem to be repeating. So they, it's an example of uh, your, your, your kind of a, your example of we have 20 things that we can manage in our brain at the one time and we can't deal with ultraviolet light, infrared light. We don't see it. We deal with this spectrum. And it's the same with the perceptive world and the acoustic world and the sensory world. We don't process all the information around us. So the ants are dealing with a whole system of communication that we don't even monitor. We mm. don't even perceive what that is. So we, I, a very good and annoying thing to do is to always try and find out what the mechanism is because nothing happens by accident. There's always a mechanism by which a thing can occur or something happens. Mm. So ants don't coordinate with one another through some form of superpower. There's a system, a process, a mechanism that allows them to communicate. We just haven't really investigated it enough and mm. we didn't have the tools to do it. And there wasn't the economic reason to figure out mm. why ants are working like that. So the other one that, I, that probably interests you is, I don't know if you've ever listened to or read the book. I think it's The Secret Life of Trees. I've heard of it. I haven't read it. It's a joy. Yeah. Listen to the audio book and kick back and take it in as a story. But the basic tenant of that is trees communicate with one another mm. and they do so through the root system and through the fungal layer that sits mm -hmm. over it. So there's a mesh of fungus mm -hmm. and it actually transfers signals from one tree to the other through mm. that fungal mesh mm. and a tree that's not doing as well because of its situation, like it's not in the light enough or it's not creating enough sugar, the trees around it will send it sugar to give it a boost because they're living and sharing those signals back and forth and going that tree short. Yeah. And if one of those trees gets attacked by an insect, <clears throat> it releases a layer of resin to deal with the insect, but it also sends that signal to the other trees around it to say, you should start creating the resin too, because these mm. insects are in the area and they shouldn't get a landing on you. And, Final point is if you're in a forest, the air, a particularly deciduous old forest, the air around you is thick with resins mm. from the leaves. So as you're 
as they say, forest bathing, which is going for a walk in a good old forest. Mm, yeah, yeah. You yeah. come out of it feeling relaxed. Yeah. Because you've just been soaked in this neuro. Like it's a, it's not a neurotoxin, but it's a neurological effect on you. It actually is a mechanism that works on your brain and calms you down and you feel less tense. Yeah. And you wonder if even with this, this almost like super intelligence or with some of these uh, larger AI type models, being able to understand all these parameters, if like we actually understand that how we're actually part of that system to a certain extent, and even the human being, you could say the human being like at a cellular level, a cell in my finger here is not aware of much more than the cells around it. Uh, a model for a human being could be almost like a coral reef. So I do diving as an example, right? So are we like a coral reef where we actually think we're one thing, but actually we're actually just a combination of lots of different cells and that systems. Magic has, yeah, yeah, like, and system, like yeah. We don't even count the viruses that live in yeah. us, the, the bacteria that we need to process yeah. everything, our biome in general. And I think yeah. the weight of viruses in our body is actually more than the weight of the cells. There's more right. of foreign matter in us than there is us. Yeah. And yeah. again, the concept of person as an ecosystem is enormously complex and we're only scratching the surface mm. as to how it all works together. Like we don't really understand it. Like we really mm. don't. If it's when people start talking about AI acting as a human and with the psychology of a human, they go, Oh, I'm delighted that you've cracked the psychology of individuals problems because mm. cognition is a black box to us still like little mm. lights go on when we do the cognitive scanning, but cognition itself very poorly understood well, i was on a it was an institute of physics webinar yesterday i think it was and they're talking a bit about some of the stuff you're talking about how you can you can clip all the different connections and you can do something like 80 percent of the connections and actually the model still works which comes back to the example you were using but then also they're talking about brain and understanding around how the brain works and so these almost like neural networks can help us understand the way the brain works with the relationships but also can it even be used to understand for example disease pathways as yeah. well so we don't understand much about the brain no. will it allow us to do that? that to then actually help solve problems like brain issues as an example because intellectually we can't understand it but we need the computers to help us do that it's a very interesting kind of linkage to what you were talking about yeah and the just the human conceit of the way so the way we structure how we the goal here is oh if the machine could think like us it would be smarter right and so we think that the way forward is symbolic reasoning and there's particular approaches to to design mm -hmm. but what's happened is that the large language models and the probability based just sheer it doesn't matter if was, what's the next word it's probability based the mm -hmm. ability to do that turned out to be so much more powerful for a machine's thinking mm -hmm. so we're trying to model how a person thinks and take that and put it in a machine but what actually worked was let the machine do machine thinking and it'll get a different outcome or a different way to that outcome, but it ends up in a lot of the area you would have ended up with, with your symbolic yeah. reasoning. Yeah. And it, I think it'll raise some interesting issues. I was at a presentation in 2009 on iPhone data, sorry, so it was mm. phone data from a US carrier. And what they did is they tracked all the young people in New York on, on a typical day. And they then patterned it over New York and they went, look, look here's where they are. Isn't it amazing? Go, wow. Yeah. Okay. What now? And they said something really interesting happened. It says, we can tell up to like, I think it was 85% at that time. We can tell you, we can tell where you will be at seven o'clock tomorrow. I go, mm. that's amazing. How can you mm. do that? He says, cause people do the same things over and over again. Yeah. I'm only going to go to two places on a Friday. It's like that bar or my sister's house. Yeah. That's what I do on a Friday. Yeah. Like, out of all the options you could do globally, fly to Paris, dive in yeah. the ocean, swim in the Maldives. <laughs> yeah. Like, you go to your sister's yeah. or go into the pub. That's what yeah. you actually yeah. did. And I have a feeling that when you see the data, you'll go, oh, we all kind of behave in very similar patterns. Mm -hmm. And it's not that complicated to predict what we're likely to do. Like mm. our brains and our emotions are structured to get us to act in certain ways. And maybe, but, sorry. No, I was going to, I was going to, sorry to interject, but I was going to say, but that's one of the models around the brain, isn't it? The brain is actually a prediction machine because yeah. we, we're not physically 
computing the stuff and we're using like predictions to say this is what I'm going to say next and I, I wonder what it's actually going to teach us around actually by reflection on we think we're different than we actually are and the way we actually work might be actually very similar to the way we're actually building these models that's yeah it's interesting the it goes I think back to there's this idea of authentic selves mm. and what is a person and an authentic individual and personhood, who are you? What is that mm. little round thing in your brain, the homunculus of you? Mm. And we all have an idea that we're an individual consciousness and that exists. And then you look at any neurologist or cognitive scientist and they go, oh, that's not real. And you go, oh, what do you mean? No, that, that's not real. That's, that's an effect. It's not a thing. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. an effect. So, oh, okay. <laughs> Let, let's go from there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just try and resist in the reality where well, I believe it's the case, at least anyway, because that's what helps me get through the day to a certain extent. There, there is a phrase, and I'm going to say it incorrectly, but the general tint of it will be correct. And I'll dig up the word. It's umwelt. There's an umwelt is the sensory environment and sensory net that you live in as a beast right and mm. the relationship you have creates the senses creates the feeling of looking the sound of hearing you're creating this reality as you're moving through it and everyone's is different and every mm. culture is slightly different because mm. they have different contexts they have different environments there's a way of being in the world that if you think about it as an umwelt it allows you to go okay it's it's this co-creation space between mm. you and your environment and cognition and sense and experience and that processing of all that together ends up creating this entity that you think of as you or your consciousness mm. and it will be really interesting eventually like uh, copernicus thinking that the the earth or the sun did not revolve around the earth the earth revolved around the sun and guess what there's different planets out there mm. and if all that is the case then maybe there's no God. Maybe this whole Garden of Eden story thing that mm. we had was, and then God started, a Christian God started to die off and that kind of thing started to, mm. to, to fall into the background and you had the enlightenment. And I wonder what would happen if we all in 20 years time were confronted with actually all that thing about the individual and human consciousness and the gift of consciousness. None of it's real folks. Here's the data. Here's the, Here's how you can... It could be just like it, the Earth becomes a system, doesn't it? And we have to look after... I'm getting environmentalist here, but we have to look after the trees because we interact with them as much as they... Maybe the Earth becomes... Maybe then the universe becomes a system and it just be all, it's all just one big system. And although we, we almost have the arrogance to say that we're just... We're individuals as part of that, but actually we're just part of this bigger system. And it almost like... I want, And if you can model it, yeah. then we could... Hum, the human race or Earth could do some amazing things. That's the project of the university thing I'm involved in yeah. advising that that's the kind of goal is to change the thinking structures mm. so that people can bring it into life and make change happen because i think mm. like you only have to hear you'll never get change in the nhs it's mm. just it's unchangeable the only way to do mm. it is to level it oh you never get change in politics because blah, blah, blah. you'll never get change and it's because change is so hard to make happen and what you need is people then with the tools and the resilience and the levers and the supports that help make change stick and then bring on mm. the next change. And the only way to do that is to think systemically, is to think systematically mm. in systems wise and to be systematic in your change. I think like the nature of the challenge that we're faced with is, I think some people get it and the, the people who get it are really depressed because it's like, yeah, we're, we've just burned the planet. There is no coming back from 1.5. I don't believe mm -hmm. 1.5. I think it's absolutely going to go to 2.5. It's accelerating as well. Yeah. I think it's, it's yeah. really accelerating. Yeah. It's really scary what's going yeah. on. Yeah. It's like if, you, if you're looking at any of this and following any of this information, it's hard to be worried about other stuff. Yeah. There's nowhere else to go. Even I went on a on a long haul flight. It was the first long haul flight I've been on for a long time. But you, it's so easy to go different places, and you think I can be on the other side of the world in, in an afternoon. You're thinking like, but there's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else. To go. I can go anywhere in the world, right? Yeah, but yeah. But there is. Are we, we got to be looking after the stuff that we've actually got? We've got to be looking after, and that's burning all the stuff to get there, right? And it's yeah. like we just we've got to be thinking about how do we fix the system to keep where we live, 
habitable, really. I, I think so. I, look, we're on the same hymn sheet here. It's yeah. just how do we how do we make change happen, and that's the hard bit. But I do think your points around that the number of parameters and can you use these new analytical techniques to understand much more complex systems than we've ever done before? Yeah, I think it's fascinating, and that even in terms of I mean, in terms of tech things like coding, how do you code more complex systems? But also then like brain pathways, environmental pathways. How do you do that? How do you change behaviors? How do you be persuasive for people? I think it's fascinating. Chris, let me just give you just two examples. This is from yesterday, mm. like mm. yesterday. Some guy went to chat GPT and he, within a couple of hours, created and with no coding, just by instruction prompts, got it to make a, a virus, mm. a computer virus that could enter your computer and exfiltrate your files. And he did that just creating it with chat GPT, no code, no experience created like a world class virus and just went, holy crap. Yes, mm. there was ways that the system tried to stop him do it, but he was able to break down the tasks and then recombine the tasks so that it got done. Mm. So there's a certain amount of kind of smartness in it. Now, if you are, and I'm sure the really smart people at Google and IBM and all the rest of them have been on this for years. They know that they have all the data from the medical experiments, from the medical files in the hospitals. And they can look through your last 20 scans of your lung and match that with your 20 scans of your blood and match that with some other Apple data from your wrist. Mm. They go, actually, we should, pull, we should call Paul in and just give him a blood test on virus B because there's something mm. on his lung there that, that was different than yesterday. And it was only able to do that because AI was able to cross barriers and figure out that thing could be religious. So many thing. attributes, yeah. So yeah. many things. Yeah. And for take that for all pictures of all things in all situations and then go, what next? What could happen? And it, I know that sounds so much like everything, but how do I get another example of that? It, this is like not, this is not bananas territory, but if you take, actually, this is, this is another example. It's a real world example. They're able to take pictures now of the vineyard and go, uh, the drone flies over the vineyard back and forth. Okay. It's hmm. aero, it's solar powered, has no exhausts and stuff like that. So it's taking pictures all day long. And then you're it's analyzing the picture and it's going because it's doing it on, I think it's ultraviolet or infrared. I can't remember which one. And it goes, oh, there's a, a insect pest on that mm. particular vine. And it comes down and just zaps that mm. and it goes back up. And what happens is you have a pharmaceutical free vineyard. It's like there's mm. no pharmaceuticals used at all in, in the production. Mm. And you go, oh, that's interesting. So solar powered, it's a drone. It's used to monitor something that didn't get monitored before. And it's able to take an action. That means you don't need pharmaceuticals in your pesticide control. And you go, that's not something that I would have said is going to happen. That's not mm. something I would have predicted. And you go, okay, maybe this stuff could go really interesting, really fast. If everything can be, like if vision systems can look at a field and tell you what's going on and can alert you or give you actions or tell you things. Because mm. one of the things that I was looking at yesterday, someone wanted to talk about facial recognition systems. And so it, they were talking about people and mm. facial recognition and your right to privacy and stuff. And I said, yeah, what about animals? I said, what? It's just facial recognition systems work on animals. Yeah. This is, what do you mean? This is, in Ireland, there's a company and it knows that this cow, because it recognizes its face and colors, ate this much and went over there and exercised that I think much. I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. I said, okay. So what? I said, lots of interesting things happen once you can identify the thing. You go, that thing moved. It's data. Mm. That thing tends to like that corner. Don't know why. Mm. This thing tends to eat at this time and not that time. Don't know why. 
But mm. now I've got some data and I could tie it to a, an object, a person or a thing and do the next iteration of why might that mm. be happening? And so the idea of sensing, monitoring, I think that's all very much going to be visual systems predominantly. You can monitor like voice, noise, auditory, but it tends to, and it's good. Mm. But I think that it's like a quantum better when it's with voice, with, when it's visual data. I think visual data is going to do a lot more interesting things than we understand right now. I, I think it's going to be, that's going to be a real observable world. Like what changes in the world when that happens? I don't think we're that far away from, because you're, you've got these augmented reality glasses as an example, but there's an app, there's a Cornell University got an app around bird ID. I don't know, is it Merlin bird yeah, ID? Yeah, I got right? it, yeah. Uh, and, it, and it's fantastic, yeah. I, I, absolutely wonderful. Wherever I'm going out for a walk and it, and it clicks up, these are the birds you're hearing, right? Some of learning the bird. It's not that far away from having that visually where you're wearing the glasses and it'll point out, the information you're interested in. So what plants there are, oh, there's wild garlic over there, or this is the bird that's happening in the background. They'll give you a history around what's happening in the background. And all the information is available. I can go and look it up on the internet today. It just takes me a long time to do it. But the processing power to be able to do it instantly, almost like as you're watching and who's people's, what people's names are and what their background are, it's really not that far away at all, I don't feel. So I, I don't think so either at all. Yeah. And, and the way I conceptually think about it is it's remediating our relationship with the world yeah. because you're now able to connect to it and understand it in ways that deepen your relationship with it. But it's got to, that's how it has to be framed. Like, mm. um, um, like, uh, I was out for, I live by a river and. I'm blessed with the fact that I can just walk and hear the bird song in my lunch break and stuff like that. And I really make a point of doing it. And I'd be there now and the, my, sometimes my wife is with me and I could say, Oh, that's the, the black, that's the oh, cool tit. Cause making mm. that squeaky noise. I says, mm. you can hear, ee, 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 that's the cool tit. Mm. And she goes, Oh, and I says, that one there is, that's a thrush. And she mm. goes, I'd love to be able to tell all the birds apart. Yeah. And I said, it's practice. Yeah. He says, you just, you're listening, you go and look it up. You go, that was the one you recorded. You maybe use the app, but what happens is generalized bird song now becomes individuated and you can mm. name them and you can position them and you can relate to what's going on and you understand it a little bit better. So your relationship mm. to the world is deepened by understanding it a bit more. Yeah. And I think that, that hasn't acted on the world in some way, like you haven't changed things, but it's that thing about facilitating the relationship between a person and the world. How does technology do that better? So that mm. it, I think what is foregrounding the individual, it's like, mm. how can we make it so that you better meet people? Mm. You're able to better listen to them. You're able to better be better with people. One of, one of the guys I, I live around here, he works in a deprived area, trying to get people involved and engaged and doing things. And he said, the biggest problem they have with violence is impulse control. He says, no one's got the ability to stop and think about consequences, mm. about what's happening and control them mm. because they're all dealing with some level of trauma, whatever mm. it is, anger, is some form of trauma. It's some form of thing that's happened to you that you are no longer able to control your own temper. You just haven't mm. developed the skills mm. to do it. What if something was able to help a person understand that they were in a pre anger situation? Mm. Beep. Hey, Paul, this kind of conversation tends to send you into a spiral of anger. And you go, oh, that yeah. is right. Yeah. I'll be back and I'll talk to you in 10 minutes. I need to put out the bins. And you leave yeah. the conversation <laughs> and then you come back yeah. and you go, cause most behavior change is actually the setup. Mm. It's not the behavior. It's the situation before the behavior happens. So if you are able to sense that, then the behavior doesn't happen. Then you mm. can start doing the cognitive kind of work to say, did you recognize the situation? Mm. Did you, so it's, I think those soft areas of sensing and then 
helping people understand the world that they live in will be very nondescript. It won't be like followed around by big robots. It'll be like a watch or something telling us something. I just reflect on like how much would I, how much I knew 30 years ago, let's say, like pre-internet versus how much you know now and the ability to watch stuff on YouTube and the stuff I know about, I'm getting into all sorts of things. I'm not an expert in all this stuff, but I'm just like so much more rounded and better educated. And if you get, take that further ahead and you have this extra insight that's actually happening, how much more would we know? And you need the cognitive load to be taken off you to be able to do things with it. But you just suddenly, you start to know about uh, birds and how the system's interacting in a way that we didn't before. It's fascinating. hundred percent. And if you take, uh, I took, a. Uh, a poem from, I think it was Seamus Heaney, and I put it into the web, the ChatGPT, and I said, analyze this poem using the ideas of syntax and vocabulary and something else and related to history mm. and related whatever, and give me an analysis of how that happened. Mm. And it was really good job. Like it did a really mm. good job. I said, wow, that's really quite good. And then I put something in I made up and I said, this is a poet named whatever. He's done this in relation to the Seamus Heaney poem, do an analysis of the compare and contrast kind of thing. Mm. And it came back and it said, oh, this author took that view and this author took that view. And said, wow, that's really good. Now, mm. imagine if you took, to go back to our business and say, hey, I want to take two loan agreements mm. and I put them into the chat and I say, compare these loan agreements and tell me which one is better and why. And you go, this one is better for this and that one's better for that. And so, okay, if you were da, 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 and you wanted to do X, Y, and Z, how would you have written that agreement? And you go, oh, mm. I, I, this is the agreement I would have gone with. And you go, oh, that looks like a better agreement. Mm. I'm going to send this agreement back to the company and go, actually, this is the agreement I want to sign, not the other one that you have. Mm. And you go, oh, okay, we don't operate like that. This is our agreements. And mm. you go, yeah, but the minute people can do trip advisor for whatever it is you do it's i don't like the policy changes i don't like the things that you've done here for whatever service it is it oh that's going to change like mm. how many times have you clicked accept on 230 pages of an apple change of services agreement for how we're going to deal with your data on your iphone mm. or your laptop if you have the ability to just get that and send it to chat gpt and go tell me what I should be worried about in this document. And it goes, mm. the major issue in this document is they're no longer storing your data in the EU. And I go, yeah. that's not acceptable. What yeah. should I do to change that with this particular agreement? Oh, you have to go to here and here and change these settings. I go, okay, that's what I'm going to do that then. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. I like the idea of, so as I talking about death advice earlier in the week and almost like how do you present different personas to be persuasive for people to not get into debt? This is pre-collection to not get into debt. And you, know, you might be chatting to someone down the pub might be different to chatting to someone who might be going to a sports field or there with their kids or whatever it is. And we all have different personas. What might be persuasive for me is not persuasive for someone else. And how do you have an almost like an agent that can change the way they interact with you to get the outcome that's actually better for that person. I think that's, that kind of stuff is fascinating. It, it is fascinating. So if I gave you seven words and said, these seven words describe humanity, what would you think? Mm. Would you think this is rock solid? Or would you go, I think we should investigate this a little bit more about how we think about personalities and mm. how that's framed and how scientific or not that is. All you can do is say, I get better outcomes when I do this and this. Actually, that's what I was going to say. You can use the data. to yep. do it. So if I test these seven different scenarios, I get better outcomes based on these attributes here and it gives me a better outcome. So I mean, that's uh, it. it. Yeah. It's, it's based off the data. Rather. Why I get hung up on this is I used to be an academic and I never truly right. lost the habit of thinking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, what happens is when you get down into the, into definitions and say, why is this definition here and who defines it and how strong is that? It usually comes down to a thing called, oh, what was it called now? The internal consistency of the factor. Mm. So if you do factor analysis of something, the factor itself will have various measures of how specific it is in measuring that thing, like its internal consistency. 
And it has to sit, if you're using that factor, it has to be tied to the exact questions that was used mm. to use that because mm. that's how the things are built. So when someone comes along and says, okay, company size is related to their ability to do X, which would be a typical academic framework. You go define size. How did you define it? Why did you define it by number of people and not number of outlets or turnover or revenue? Or, yeah. Like your even definition of size wasn't nailed mm. down to anything in particular and no basis yeah. in fact under it. So with regards, uh, I will come back. There's one other point I'll make and I'll come back. If you look at the repeatability of all the experiments in cognitive psychology, there's some bananas number, like 90% of all mm. the experiments conducted in cognitive psychology were not repeated. Mm. So they have no basis in science, none of them. And the mm. whole area got that close to being abandoned around five or six years mm. ago because the theory base was so weak uh, mm. in, in, the, in, the, in the science of what they're talking about. So when I hear about ours is based on psychology and it's based on, I, say, I go, oh, that's really interesting. Can we get into what theory of the mind you're using? What theory of the psychology you're using? Mm. What personality types? Where are you getting your research base from compared to what was that decision? And people mm. will go, actually, I don't want to be in this conversation anymore because this mm. is spiral. I thought it was a good idea to do that. I thought mm. like we could friendly people versus formal people, emotional mm. people versus rational people, Irish people versus Italian people. Make your categories up as you go along. And so I'm very skeptical of how scientific these things are. I think the most solid base of what's going on with you in terms of your cognitions, et cetera, is the actual biomarkers. Like biomarkers mm. are like observable. You can say that happened, that happened. Your voice, your voice, your eyes, your eyes. Very hard to. But I suppose human beings, we try to simplify things. I was, when you were explaining, I was thinking that's very Victorian, actually. It's worked, it's worked us very well in science, hasn't it? We try and simplify things to understand them. I mean, my background originally was physics, right? And like the deeper you drill down into something, you realize that nothing really exists. It, it, right? Yes, it, it falls apart. <laughs> it falls apart yeah, yeah. into probabilities yeah, 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 at, the, yeah. at, the, at the end, right? Yeah, yeah. And, it's, it's, and it's at what point do you want to have to group things and is it helpful or not to get there? But I, but maybe and maybe these these new mathematical models will actually help us really understand the next level of complexity down. You've gone straight to where I was going, which is yeah. it's if you just throw away those concepts of personality altogether and just mm. say it's this is all the data I have about this person and mm. then let the model figure out, okay, yeah. these are the paths, this is what happened, and then you can't let it go completely free because there's things yeah. that it could do that you don't want it to do. But I think what you might, I like it. So they found that I think it was a certain type of man. I think it was like 55 to 65 or something like that was consistently late for NHS appointments. And you're saying, are they a certain type of person? Are they not reliable? Yeah. Do they forget? Yeah. Are they whatever? And they went in and they looked and then some bright spark went, how did they get to the hospital? Public transport. Why were they late? Public transport let them down. They yeah. couldn't get there. If you had two buses, one needed to join to the other to get you there on time. Yeah. You were screwed. There was yeah. a percentage of times that the transport was going to let you down and therefore you were going to make it. It had nothing to do with your with personality age, or your whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever. But if, if, if models end up having access to all the data around more and more data, it'll make the inferences. I don't think it's ever going to have access to all the data, like across all systems and all life, because that's just not the way that's going to go. I think that we're going to see, if you ever hear this, there's another c concept called context collapse. Context collapses was observed in social networks where I'm on Facebook and I'm friendly, happy Paul who lives here in, I live in, in, in my area. Twitter is I'm interested in these kind of things. And yeah. LinkedIn is this is my professional work life. And this is what I talk about. All three are different parts of who I am 
and there's mm -hmm. separate contexts in which I want to manage those relationships. But what happens over time is they start bleeding into one another. Like I start mm -hmm. posting on Facebook about what's happened in my company. I go well, LinkedIn and more getting more social as an example. Right. right. And so what's happening is the context of each of those things starts to collapse and mm. the attenuation data mm. actually drifts. And what mm. happens is what I'm saying on LinkedIn loses its predictability as to whether or not I'm looking for another job or whether I'm looking to hire or whatever, because I've polluted the clarity of the context with all this mm. other data. And so the, that context collapse, I think, in all sorts of data happens. And what will happen, I think, next is the LLMs will just find a new path through the data to say there are certain things that just tend to work. These are the things yeah. that you tend to offer. And I don't know if, I, I think that they, I think it will give hyper specific paths for people to get things done. The question yeah. is then, how do you govern that? Like, how do you make sure that you've got control over those processes and that you mm. don't, you don't get people to do one bad thing so that they end up with a good thing. Like I, I used to have this example where when Amazon came out and it had the Amazon screen and it could see you and actually what it could see is you and your room and your posture and what it was judging was your mood. Mm -hmm. And it was going, let's see, Paul, happy, Paul, sad, Paul, mm -hmm. very sad. Posture mm -hmm. can tell you an awful lot. And uh, let's say I stand up in the morning, I ask Amazon, does this suit me? And he goes, yes, that color, that tone, that cut does mm -hmm. flatter your whatever and whatever. I go, oh, okay. And he goes, hey, Amazon has a special offer on chocolate cake today. Would you like chocolate cake? And yeah. I go, yeah, I, I love chocolate cake. <laughs> Ding dong, hour later, chocolate cake arrives at my door. I eat chocolate cake. I'm happy. 10 minutes later, I go, I shouldn't have really eaten chocolate cake. I've enough weight as it is. I should be getting whatever. Hey, Paul, would you like to look at our gym equipment? Yeah, I suppose I better look at gym equipment, right? Yeah, I'll order some. Gym equipment would be good for me. Hey, as an AI, the path of offering a depressed person chocolate cake and selling him gym equipment works. Yeah. Why don't we just do that? Say, yeah. oh, okay, that's probably not a good path to, yeah. to have out there. So I think that the idea of like the categories that we've lived with and how we think about, like, how, I think the opportunity is in breaking those and looking deeper into what's happening and figuring out just much more nuanced way what's going on. And we are examining messages from people who are, like in difficulty, as I'm sure you've seen in many different instances, and people's lives are complicated. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah, a lot absolutely. going on. And, yeah. and if you're offering someone yes, no, maybe, then that's not really helping. That's mm. not really getting into something with someone and figuring out how much they need to or want to engage with you. And maybe not everyone needs to engage with you. Maybe people just need to mm. have a firm line and understand that they need to keep it. But the opportunity seems to me to be to not keep the categories that we always have, to not keep yeah. the culturally defined things that we inevitably have that we're blind to most of the time anyway, and just use the opportunity to be much more attenuated, much more hmm. considered about what might happen. Yeah, so it's sort of like losing that reductive analysis that we use, we're reducing it down to the factors and maybe just taking it up a step. I, I really appreciate you making the time. It's fascinating. It's good to chat to you as well. Paul, thanks very much. I really appreciate right. it.